<laughs> Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. And uh, I got a message this morning. I think it's going to minister to you. Um, I want to talk to anybody who's ever thought they prayed to the Lord and didn't get an answer. Amen. And uh, you prayed real hard. You did everything right. Maybe even fasted for 40 days and fa fell over a faint. And uh, still, it didn't, it didn't feel that your prayer got answered. Well, listen up this morning. I'm going to show you exactly what happened. Amen? Praise the Lord, according to the Word. So uh, if you got your Bibles this morning, I'm going to probably reference several scriptures. Uh, I want to talk about things. But uh, the title of my message this morning is The Seed Form Blessing. Now, to let you in a little bit, my wife and I, um, my wife of 51 years coming up, praise the Lord. Never married, married anybody else, just her and I. Um, we, we have an activity that we enjoy um, a lot as far as recreation. We, we scuba dive. Most of you know that. Now, tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up in the morning, probably around 5.30 or so. I'm going to get all my stuff ready. My gear will already be packed the night before. I'm going to load it all into the car. And my wife and I are going to get in the car tomorrow morning. And before the car even starts up or pulls out of the driveway, I'm going to say this little prayer. I'm going to say, Lord, thank you for keeping us safe. Keep everybody on the boat in, in safety also as we go ahead and we join. I also thank him. I said, thank you for the opportunity to be able to do this and to go out and enjoy the, the uh, underneath the ocean that a lot of people don't ever get the chance to see except by pictures. I said, I, I thank the Lord for that. And we say, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we go up, drive off, we set up. And now I'll get on the boat. I'll put all my gear on the boat. We'll get all set up. We'll go out there. And basically, when I get to the dive site, they'll tie the boat up, and I'll step off the back, and I'm in another world. And I'll come back safely. I've done this over a 1,000 times. I've come back safely, and here I am. The Lord answered my prayer, didn't he? But before the Lord can answer my prayer, I left out a whole bunch of stuff that has to happen first. I have to be prepared to make that dive. I have to be prepared. In other words, I have to have the certifications. So they're not going to be on the boat. I have to have all the things ready because the, the diving that Diane and I like to do is deep diving. And we like to do wreck diving. So basically, that takes an advanced certification uh, uh, and, and takes a certain preparation. Another thing I have to do, I have to have own the equipment because the equipment is very important if you don't want to drown. <laughs> Otherwise, it's no longer a dive. It's a, it's a funeral. Praise the Lord. So, so I have to have all this in preparation. And then the Lord watches over my safety just like I prayed. So he's assuming that I'm, that I'm certified, I can do this thing, and I'm ready to carry out all the tasks that it takes. That means I've gone through all my classes, I've gone through all my schooling, I've done all the skills, I've done everything else. And I pick out equipment, the equipment I've set up just for myself. There's certain things I like, certain things I don't like. Uh, the equipment market is, is a, is, is a moneymaker. So basically, I like certain kind of gear, like the certain kind of uh, types of stuff, and I pick it all, it's all fit me. My equipment is... is personal to me. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that the fact is, is a lot of times you, what you think is not answered prayer is probably a lack of preparation. I just throw that in, in there for, for uh, uh, yes, but this is what I, I want to talk about this morning. Most of the time, our greatest prayers are answered in seed form. Understand that. Because we're not looking for seed, we say the prayer goes unanswered. How many know, I said this before, I says, God wants to co-labor with us in about everything we do. Matter of fact, it's not about what we do, it's about what he tells us to do. He comes in and gives us, and then we carry that out, but he does it in such a way that he wants to co-labor with us. And that's what you've got to understand. So a lot of times it comes in seed form. Uh, to give us a chance to grow in our ability to stewardship the answer as it comes to in, to, in the fullness. Hmm. Uh, we must see the potential in the answer. He gives us, or we will not take care of the answer properly. And therefore, we see, we, it would seemingly that God doesn't answer our prayer. Amen? In other words, I, put, I was sharing this last night with, a, with, a, with our Harp and Bowl ministry and the, the prayer and stuff we were doing. And uh, what, I was, what I shared uh, last night, I said this way, I says, we pray, and I got this vision of what I want to see happen. I got this vision of this great big giant oak tree in my front yard. So I pray, Lord, I said, there's not an oak tree there because 
you would be hard pressed to find Oak Tree in, in uh, Key West anyway. But <laughs> let's just use that for an example. Or a coconut tree, whatever you want. <laughs> if, that, if that fits better to our environment. But let's go to the Oak Tree. Now I pray for God, I said, I really want an Oak Tree. But when he, when the answer, he says, he answers my prayer. But instead of an Oak Tree, he gives me an acorn. How many oak trees are in that egg corn? Well, there's just one. But when you plant the egg corn into the ground and the oak tree finally grows, now how many oak trees do you have? It's un un innumerable, correct? A lot of times when we go to prayer, God wants to give us our prayer in seed form so that he can co-labor with us in the answer. But instead, we've learned from religion, all we want to do is sit back and we just... God is this genie in the bottle, so to speak, and basically we want to lay out all the prayer, and he's just supposed to make it happen. I can dream, and I can, I can wish, I can pray all day long. God, I want to be a, a scuba diver. I want to be a scuba diver. But if I never went through the preparation to do, and the training to do that, you, you can sit and dream all day long. And that prayer will never, seemingly never come to pass when all the time God is saying, Get certified, get certified, <laughs> get your equipment, get ready to go. You're stepping into an environment that you don't normally live in, and, and so on and so forth. Now I can pray that prayer tomorrow morning when I, when I leave the driveway. I say, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Because all the opportunities to become a scuba diver, he has placed in front of me over the years. I've been, well, I've been diving since 1984 or something like that, so we've been doing it for a long time. But the fact is, is way back then, we had to go through the process. People want to pray, but are we ready? Are we prepared to prepare ourselves for the answer? A lot of things we don't see the answer because we haven't prepared ourselves to have that answer. And we're not, in other words, we're not stewarding what God has given us. And I believe stewarding is, 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 is the key to all, to all the prosperity God gives us. Stewarding is absolutely the key. Not just wish, wishful desires, but stewarding. Help anybody this morning? Anyway, praise the Lord. So how many of us, this is how the process goes. Basically, God speaks to us through his word, or he'll speak to us through prayer. And he'll drop in our heart the word. Now, something's going to happen when he does that, and what happens next is going to be determined of where we're situated. If you read in Mark chapter 4, Jesus was explaining the parable, and he was talking about the sower and the seed, and he was talking about that very same thing. But what he said this he says the sower, when he was explaining it to his disciples, he said the sower sows the word, so the word comes forth. So we get to hear the word. So let's, let's say the word is the seed that he's talking about. So God gives us a word, which is the seed. We pray about that word, and basically what kind of soil condition we become or what we've done to prepare determines the next thing that's going to happen to harvest. But that prayer has been answered, even if it's in seed form. Am I talking to anybody this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. So here's how, so Mark, but here, now here's the thing, because in Mark 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 17, it says this, tribulation and persecution arises for the word's sake. So persecution, tribulation arises because of the word that God sowed in you. Now this particular, how many know there's four different groups there that he's talking about, and there's good soil and so on and so forth. But this soil where persecution rises, now it says this in, 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 in the verse, it says they gladly with joy received the word, but because it was on stony ground, they had no root within themselves. When persecution and trials rose up, the, the word was stolen from them. So we could say, put that in a category, okay, that was prayer that wasn't answered. I prayed and God didn't deliver, so there's a prayer that wasn't answered. When what happened was, instead of taking and getting ourselves rooted in his word, prepared to listen to that answer going forth and moving out, it didn't happen. So we chalked that up into the category as unanswered prayer. Right? Okay. Are you with me so far? Yes. All right. Seed form. I want to talk about that this morning. Uh, I, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is, is, is well, there's several, but in the Old Testament, I love the Old Testament because... It's, it's descriptive. It's, uh, I see a picture. I, I mean, I, I, I like the Old Testament. But it's 1 Kings chapter 18. That chapter talks about Elijah and, uh, Elijah and Ahab. How many remember the story? It was in, uh, the Bible says that Ahab, he was one of the most, up until that time, 
did more wickedness in the sight of the Lord than any other king of, uh, of Israel before that. So he was, he was a wicked king. So God sent Elijah, the Tishbite, to go ahead and, and begin to do two things to uh, uh, turn the country around, okay, but also he was, he was commissioned to call judgment down on the ones that were, uh, um, uh, um, that were basically false. So, uh, so Elijah did this, and he, he went there, and of course he confronted Ahab. Uh, he said there's going to be a drought for three and a half years, or there's a drought for three and a half years. God told him, uh, to tell this to Ahab, confront him, and said, I'm going to stop. I'm going to drop. There's not going to be due or rain for three and a half years. How many remember the story? Three and a half years. By the end of three and a half years, God comes to him again in, in chapter 18, and he says, okay, you go tell Ahab now I'm going to cause it to rain. So you think this was a done deal. First of all, he says, tell him it's going to stop raining. It's not going to rain again. It was immediate. That rain shut off at that point. When, he, when, when Elijah mentioned the words out of his mouth as a prophecy to Ahab, that was it. It was done. Now, they had to wait three and a half years to see what was going to happen if that word was true or not, right? So over three and a half years, of course, what did, what did God do? He provided for his prophet. He says, go to the brook Cherub. And he went to the brook Cherub well, because of the drought. The brook dried up, uh, uh, you know. And he had, um, he had ravens and stuff flying food to him. That was pretty cool. Uh, I kind of think it was um, he, he, the food came off of Jezebel's table, well, I kind of think it was. You know, the raven fly in, pick up one of those nice hot croissants or whatever, and fly right out to him. So, uh, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> whatever happened. But God, yeah, all of a sudden, the brook dried up. Here's what happens a lot of times in our Christian walk. God, we do what God tells us, and then the brook dries up. And then what do we do next? We don't have the next to that. So then what happens is, Eli then God tells Elijah, he said, go to, to this woman. He said, I got to, well, she was a Gentile. Didn't matter. He did exactly what God said. And of course, he had a, the, the meal, the oil barrel that never, never ran dry. So basically what God did, he sustained the prophet through all the drought times, the whole three and a half years. But to get what God held him, had him do, he answered the prayer. He gave him, He supplied him for the, everything that he needed. But he had to be where the prophet, where the God said for the prophet to be. So if he said go eastward and go to, to the brook Cherub, and he said I ain't going that way. There's nothing out there. Anymore. I'm going the other way. Guess what? He would have missed the provisions. A lot of times we miss the provisions because we're not where God tells us to be. Well, God is everywhere. No kidding. But you're not supposed to be. You're supposed to be exactly where God has placed you. And the circumstance around it shouldn't be the one thing to move you. Amen? It shouldn't be. Praise the Lord. I, I, you know, I, I laughed the first time God told me to come to Key West. I'm not from Key West. Uh, I was living up in Deerfield Beach. Had a house a block in from the beach off of A1A. I was in, I was, life was good and everything was fine. We're, always went to church with my wife and kids. And all of a sudden, he says, come to Key West. I said, you're joking, right? And I said, this, this, this has got to be the devil. He's just trying to get me to go the wrong direction. <laughs> of course, that, that argument never works. But anyway, I came to Key West. And basically, guess what? We've been 32 years, and God has always provided for us. But I had to do something different than a lot of pastors in, in America, American pastors. And I've been to the mission field, and the mission field this doesn't seem to be the same problem as they have in America. America, uh, the bigger the church, the more successful the minister. And that's, not, it's Amer that's an American custom. I'll get news for you, because that's not the case. I know guys in big churches, they're schmucks. They're, they're, they, they, they don't know anything. Basically, they're people pleasers and politicians. Professional pulpiteers, they call them. Praise the Lord. But the fact is, is no, that we are on a mandate for God. So I just come to Key West. And I look at Key West. If I look at Key West from day to day, I said, man, what a miserable place God has placed me in. But this is where the provisions have been. Everything you see here, God has provided for above and beyond circumstances. And so one day my secretary, Jennifer, she was going through some of the visitor's cards and different things that we had. Do you realize this little church in Key West uh, basically all churches in Key West are little, but the fact is, is our little church in Key West has ministered to over 3,000 people around the world, not counting the five different continents I preached off right from Key West. So when you look at things like that, they say, well, did God answer my prayer? Absolutely. But I had to be where he placed me to be to have those opportunities. 
those opportunities came from Key West. Those opportunities came from people that we met and different things like that over the years and, and, and everything else. I remember one particular couple, they were from Japan, and we were having a Christmas Eve celebration. This is when we had the church downtown. And uh, basically we were sitting there, and uh, it was Christmas, we, we were just having a fellowship and we were having uh, fun, and we were just encouraging one another and different things like that. And I, didn't take an, I don't take an offering on Christmas Eve uh, uh, things there. And the, the couple were there, and they, they, he says, well, you didn't take an offering, but we want to give you an offering. I says, well, we're glad to receive the offering, but uh, that was it. And I said, didn't think nothing of it. They enjoyed themselves. They left. We never saw them again. We got a letter a few weeks from that saying that what happened was when they were in our group and in our fellowship that they, they, they got under conviction. Uh, they didn't quite say it that way, but that's basically what would happen, to make a long story short. The two of them were living together, man and wife, but they weren't married. But after coming to our fellowship, and we didn't, of course, I didn't preach on marriage. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an altar call. It wasn't nothing like that. But the Holy Spirit was there enjoying, the, you know, we were enjoying the party. And the Holy Spirit was dependent upon them. And they sent me a letter from Japan saying that they got married because of our church. I wanted to thank us very much and send us another offering. <laughs> that was totally unexpected. Amen? Why? What happened? God answered that prayer because basically we've been praying. Lord, we're just praying that we have a, uh, you told us, give it, you gave us international ministry. We pray that in Key West. The Key West, we, we started the church here uh, to be a, a multiracial, multicultural church. This is what our whole vision was. This is what God told us to do. And Lord, we were praying that. And little did we know that he was doing all those things. And I never, before I ever left Key West. Amen? Seemed like small. Seemed like we overlooked those things. Elijah, get back to Elijah. Elijah says to, to um, Ahab, of course this was after the, the, the fiasco and where he killed off the prophets of Baal and so on and so forth. And uh, then he's basically, he said, he says, I hear, this is what he said in uh, 1 Kings chapter eight, uh, 18 and verse 41. It says, Elijah said to Ahab, go up and eat and drink for I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. He didn't say it was raining. He said, I hear the sound. God dropped something in his heart. Do you hear? I mean, you're pr those that are praying for healing, you're praying for prosperity. Are you hearing from the Lord? By his stripes I'm healed. Himself bore my sicknesses and carried my death. Are you hearing that? Because that's the seed that goes forth. So right there, God dropped the seed of answered prayer to end a drought that he shut up the heavens because of the evil was going on. Now they're reversing the country. They're reversing the, the whole thing. And God says, and all of a sudden the prophet says, I hear a sound of abundance of rain. I hear the sound. It wasn't raining. He just heard the sound. That answered prayer, it wasn't raining. It didn't come down. There was no deluge. It came down later. But the fact is, he got the seed and he automatically reacted like the seed was real. Right now, it's raining. The drought is over. So then he goes up, and he goes up to a high, high place, verse 43, and he begins to pray. He tells his servant. Now, he, he, he doesn't even want to look at circumstances. He puts his head between his legs, and he prays for the rain. Why would he have to pray for the rain if God already said, I sent the rain? I'm going to send, I, I mean, you, you give it the sound, the abundance of rain, but God's still required to pray. Why? Because God was going to interact with Elijah to bring that to pass. It wasn't going to be just, well, I'm going to sit in heaven and open up the valve and you're all going to get drenched. It was not at all. It's saying, now, prophet, let's interact. Put out the prayers. So he puts his head between his legs and he prays. And he sends his servant out there and the servant says, I don't see nothing. How many has ever prayed that way? They prayed and prayed and prayed, thought for sure they heard from God, but when they went out there, they didn't see anything. It didn't change. The problem is still there. The pain is still there. Ah, I guess God is going to answer my prayer. The prophet who heard a word from the Lord twice now, wanted to shut up the heavens and wanted to loose the heavens, twice he heard about, had to pray seven times. Seven different times he sent him out there. And then finally the servant comes back on the seventh time. He says, I see a cloud coming up out of the ocean the size of a man's hand. Well, what is that going to do? <laughs> and all of a sudden we start bringing judgment to this thing. What happened? It was a small seed. Do you believe what God says in his word? 
the small seed, the cloud the size of a man's hand, came in smaller than what we expect. I mean, we're looking for the skies to be black. But, well, guess what? He's, Elijah gets up and he runs. He said, it's coming, it's happening. He saw the small hand, and a uh, cloud the size of a man's hand, and he said, that's it, it's coming, it's happening, let's go. And, and he began, and it wasn't, shortly after that, the sky turned black and he opened up the skies. What happened? Well, something happened because Elijah, when he went to that place and he was standing up against the prophets of Baal, uh, you hear from your God, I'll pray to my God. And basically when, the, when they got done and the prophets of Baal couldn't produce anything to end the drought, uh, Elijah did something unusual. Now, it wasn't unusual that he took the 12 stones to the altar because all altars are made out of 12 stones for the 12 tribes of Israel, so on and so forth. So he, but he straightened them out after the, the goofballs messed it all up. He straightens it out. He puts a sacrifice on there. And then he dumps water onto the offering. We think, well, he's just showing off now. No. What he was doing, it was libation offering that he was praying out. This is what it was going to do to end the drought. He knew exactly what he was doing. And, of course, when he prayed to his God, God came down and he, he took the, lapped up the offering and the water. That's all proceeding. That's what the seed that went forth, that was the seed that went forth that added to the deluge. That all Elijah had to wait for was God to say, uh, I hear a sound from heaven, and it's the sound of rain. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. But it started all in those other steps that he prepared himself for this thing. So when he did the libation offering with the, with the, with the water, pouring it out, that was a symbol that this was going to end the drought. The, the prophets of Baal had none of that. They didn't have God's ear. They were trying to do their thing, try to walk only in their own strength. But when he poured it out, this was supposed to be, I guess they thought some, some theologians think it was some kind of fire retardant. Uh, that's a joke. It's, <laughs> fire comes down from heaven. It's not going to be a retardant in any place. It's not going to be controlled by anything. Lapped up the water, lapped up the offering, and that was it. So that set the stage, but the rain didn't happen then. It happened all of a sudden when God dropped that word in there. That word came as a seed, then nothing saw so, so happens. How many prayers have we prayed that just come as seed? Maybe the size of cloud, we, and we see a manifestation. A size, get excited over that little manifestation. Don't worry about it. I learned in Key West pastoring for the number of years. You you you, you don't see a lot of times the big things. What you got to look at, you got to get excited about the small things that you see. Okay, so we don't have the we don't have the crusades where the great big groups come down and get prayed for, and you have fifteen hundred people get healed in one motion. But we had four last night that were healed. It was a miraculous healing last night of our small group. I thought that was pretty good. Amen. That's more than just a seed. We're seeing a manifestation. So when you get excited about those things there, then you're setting yourself up. You're preparing for the next deep dive. You're preparing yourself. You're doing everything right because now your faith is being built up and now you're pushing towards, you're pressing in towards the Lord so he can co-labor with you. Now you're positioning yourself for the next blessing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. It's amazing what Jesus said in John chapter 16 because we don't see this a lot of times, but can you imagine following this with the disciples and following Jesus? Then all of a sudden Jesus springs this news on you. Uh, Jesus liked to spring things on people. Did you notice that? Okay, well anyway, he's, in, in John chapter 16, he says, he says, nevertheless I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage, New King James Bible says, it's to your advantage that I go away. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was a disciple following him, I think I'd be confused at that point. You're talking about a group of men who was getting not only answered prayer, we're seeing miracles happen just following Jesus. I mean, one thing after another. I mean, it, it, Jesus' prayer would get answered. I like what one, one guy said. He said, he says, you don't see... Uh, Jesus giving us instruction on what to do with unanswered prayer because basically he didn't have any. So he didn't tell us how, what to do when you get an unanswered prayer. He told us how to get the answers and showed us how to do it. 
But he said this, he said, it's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I depart, I will send him. So Jesus was saying this, he says, what you see here in greatness, he says, when I ascend to the Father, he says, to your advantage. Well, this is the, this is the, this is the position we live right now. We live in a position of advantage according to Christ. If you ask Jesus right now, the way we live, right here, what we're talking about, we are in an advantage. Why? Because he's going to the Father, and he becomes our intercessor. We don't have to hunt him down and look for him. Amen? He's, he's everywhere. So he said, it's to your advantage. I'm sure the disciples were confused about that scripture, or was confused about Jesus saying, what do you mean? Is, it, it's it's, it's, it's going to be better without it being present? How can that be? But he's saying it is. Amen? Praise the Lord. Jesus said that it was, is, is better without him being present. If things are not better, then we are not utilizing what God has provided for us. So basically, to get to the better, we need to start utilizing what God's given to, to us. Help anybody this morning? Yes. Praise the Lord. Anybody want to go dive with me tomorrow? <laughs> You're brave. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Amen. Another thing he says in Ephesians, Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. He says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly. How many like exceedingly abundantly when it comes to good stuff? How many like exceedingly abundantly when it comes to problems? Oh, yeah. I saw you, Elder. Put your hands down. I praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, we like that abundance when it's good, but we don't like that abundance when it seems to be problems. But he said, to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power, what? That works in God? The power that works in us. That's what it says. The power that works in us. So what happens is God gives us the power. Understand two things in there. Power comes through an encounter. Authority comes through commission. You have both. Power and authority through Christ. But the power of God comes into the encounter of God. Remember, I've been talking about this for, for a few months now. I said, we've got to press into the presence of God. This is the most important thing. It's the most important thing. Let's press into his presence. Because without his presence, you're just going just to go through motions. But when we can lean in to listen to the voice of God, when we lean into his presence, and actually feel his presence when he comes in, it changes everything. It's a whole game change. It's a whole new, new day. Amen? But what happens is that, that power comes from the encounter with Christ. The authority comes from the commission of Christ. But the power comes from him. That dudamus power, it says in the Greek, dudam, the word dudamus, which we get the word di dynamite, I guess some of you will say. But the fact is, is when we come into the power, it's when we come into the presence. Now when we turn from the presence of God to go about and co-labor with him and what he's called us to do, now the power comes together and the authority is behind it. The power calls them, causes the miraculous, the authority runs off the devil. If you've ever seen a manifestation of the devil, that's not his best card. That's his last card. Whenever the devil manifests himself and shows himself, it's not the, it's not the best day for him. It's the last. In other words, it's, that happens right before he has to go. Praise the Lord. I just thought I'd give you that for no extra charge. Praise the Lord. The size of our problem matters little when we see the solution bigger. So can we see the potential in the seed to our answered prayer? Lord, I need to pay the rent. God, I don't have any money. I'm broke. I need to pay the rent. You go outside and you find a dollar on the sidewalk. Thank you, Jesus. Do you see the rent money in that? Not in this town. <laughs> I mean, you're talking $2,000 a month for a one-bedroom apartment. I don't see that. I mean, what am I supposed to do with this thing? Sow it. That's your seed. Sow it and see what happens when God comes in. If he can trust you with a little, he can trust you with the much. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. I, um, so I tell people all the time, be very thankful. How do we show thanksgiving? How, be very thankful for what God has given you. Did, he give you. did God provide for you a car? I don't care if it's a piece of junk, it rattles and it's ready to fall apart. Clean and wax it. Every, all, all, keep it clean. Keep it nice. Keep it updated the best you can. Because the appreciation that we show God is taking care of and being a good steward of what he's given us. I've rented houses before. I own a house now, but I've rented a house before. 
no matter what house I ever rented, every landlord that I ever rented from was sorry to see me go because I treated the house like it was my house even though I was only renting. Amen? Why? Because it wasn't about the house. It was not about the landlord. The landlord thought they were just making money off of me, but all I saw was God's provision. God provided that for me, and to show my appreciation, to show my stewardship towards God, I took care of that house. We lived in one house, rented for nine years, and a woman never came out to see her house. She said, I'll take care of it. Mr. Robinson, I'll, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Uh, you, you need the air conditioner repair? No problem. I'll, I'll call them up. So you'll do that? Yeah, no problem. I mowed the lawn. I kept the place nice, just like it was mine. When we, when we finally left after nine years, she did cry. <laughs> so it was, well, we, got it. we had to go sometime. What happens is when we, when we appreciate what God has given us, and we show that appreciation by being a good steward of it. Uh, but anyway, I had an old car, beat up car. It was it was had a whole, over 150,000 miles on it. It was it, it it was it was old. It was just run down. I'd be out there in the driveway. I'd wax that car. I'd shine that car. Thank you, Jesus. That car. Pray that. And my dad said it's the cleanest piece of junk in the neighborhood. <laughs> so I don't care. It's my piece of junk. It's mine. I'm gonna, and I always appreciate that what God has given me by doing it. Same thing. Take care of the building. Same way. Take care of the building. Because what we're stewardshipping, because what happens is that becomes a seed where you're at right now. But if we take care of the seed, if we cultivate it right, if we're stewards over that, then God brings it to pass and he brings, this, brings the abundance. You're looking for the abundance off the bat. Basically, what people want to do, they want to pray and they want God to deliver it to them right there in their lap. How many's ever prayed for a job and you got it sitting at home in your pajamas? Never happened to me. I mean, well, if I needed a job, Lord, I believe you, and, and I would go and, and basically apply for a job back when I was working. Amen? And a job. And finally, uh, um, I got a job that I can't say no to. <laughs> but anyway, so the, the, but this is it. Um, it makes a difference. That seed that we get from our prayer, you have to first recognize it. So when you go ahead and pray and God does deliver the seed, now what you do, here's, here's what I do. Take that seed and bring it into the presence of God. Because in the presence of God, there's miraculous growth. Amen? In the presence of God, there's miraculous growth. Praise the Lord. All right. How many remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? You remember that story? How many loaves did they have? How many fishes did they have? Who cares? It wasn't enough. The numbers are insignificant. It wasn't enough to feed the crowd. It was a shortage, right? So you can count it all day long. It's not going to be any more. It's just that was how much they had. Five loaves, two fishes, that was what he had. So they basically they give it to Jesus. And listen to this in John chapter 6, verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and we had given thanks. He distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples who sat, were sitting, those sitting down. And likewise of the fish, listen to this, as much as they wanted, not as much as there was there, as much as they wanted, talk about feeding the crown. In other words, the want, well, let me back up a little bit. Let me back up. Jesus took the loaves, and when he's given thanks, hmm, it must be that our thanksgiving has something to do with this. Are you here? In other words, a little that was provided was made a lot in the atmosphere of thanksgiving. But who did the miracle? Some people say Jesus did. Jesus didn't hand, he'd hand it over to the disciples. Why? Because God desires to co-labor with us, not just do it for us. So Jesus, with thanksgiving, thank the Lord, thank you, Father, for this moment. And when he gave it, that atmosphere of thanksgiving, giving it to his disciples, they kept passing out, and the passing out in the baskets, they kept filling, there was more, there was more, there was more, there was more. And not only did he feed, now they said 5,000, the only ones in, in the Bible times were counted were the men. But there could have been as, as many as ten to 15,000 people there, 5,000 men. And when they got done, they had 12 baskets left over. 
they had leftovers. There was more than an abundance. But if they looked at the small seed that was given to them, but Jesus took what was small, he takes what our ideas that seem to be small to him, but when, we're, when we give it to him in the atmosphere of thanksgiving, it becomes multiplied. Now we see the big. Amen? But how many people will thank him? How many people will just grumble and say, I mean, I prayed and prayed and prayed. I fasted. I did this. I did this. And they talk about all their sacrifice, but I still didn't see anything. Maybe because they weren't looking for the seed. They were looking for the entire complete answer. In other words, they were looking for the tree, and all they found was an acorn. And they snuffed it off as nothing important. They snuffed it off as nothing as, as, that, that isn't worth nothing. I guess God just doesn't answer prayer nowadays. I guess he just doesn't do that. Amen? It's amazing when, in, in things that we, 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 uh, we go to the Lord with. And, uh, <laughs> I think back of the years of this ministry and what God has done, and this is beyond anything I could ever ask for or think about. But he took, he took the, willingness, he took the see, seed of willingness to yield myself. In other words, God's work came first. You know, was, had a priority in my life. When Jesus becomes a priority, I'm not talking about an add-on. I'm talking about a priority. I'm not talking about something to kill some time. I'm talking about priority. And when we live that life and we enter that encounter, it does something not only to change us, but it changes the circumstances around us. Because the God in us wants to come out of us and create the world around us. That make sense? All right, praise the Lord. Amen. The rich young ruler. How many remember the rich young ruler? He walks up to Jesus. I'm giving you another example of how this works. The rich young ruler comes up, and he was every evangelist's dream. Come up to you. What good teacher, what must I do to be saved? Now, most evangelists would jump all over that statement. Oh, well, let me go over here. We got five steps to this, six steps to that, 13 steps to this, and four steps to that. You do all that, and guess what? You're in. Jesus didn't do that. He said, once in a while, he questioned him. He said, why do you call me good? He said, none good but God. So, in other words, air in a conversation, but he's saying, you're saying I'm God? The guy didn't say nothing. He said, he says, he says do you know what the, the law says? Isn't there something that Jesus, instead of telling him how to, with what he had for him, he brought him back to the law. Why did he do that? Because he knew he was the completion of all the law. So why did he bring the guy back to the law? He brought the guy back to what the guy knows in hopes to build a momentum to bring him to what he wanted him to, to become. God does the same thing for us. He brings us first. He starts at what we know. In other words, he says, okay, he says, you do love. He said, well, I've done these things. Okay, now let's bring the momentum for the next thing. He said, take all your goods, sell all you have, you can come follow me. Look at the opportunity. Person-to-person -person contact with Jesus. What could you possibly own that is more valuable than that? If the person looked correctly at the good teacher he's talking about, because the good teacher in those days, uh, their advice was, was, was golden. So evidently, he hadn't done what he said he did, he didn't, but, but Jesus had to first bring him back to what he knew, and when he brought him back to what he knew, then he could bring him forward to what he wanted him to be. And it's the same thing with us when we go to pray. Where are you willing to, where are you willing to jump? What's your jumping off point? If you say, well, Lord, I need a miracle. Good. Are you willing to follow me? And see to it that other people get their miracle too. Or you just want your miracle to make your life more comfortable. I don't know. I guess praise the Lord. It's a question. Amen. But this is what he was saying. Well, the, the rich man, he hung his head and he walked away because he said he had lots of riches. And, of course, the disciples questioned that. So, well, then who can get into heaven? In other words, they were rich too. <laughs> I mean, who else can take off three years, three and a half years from their job and just follow Jesus around? You know, and, and uh, they... They had abundance. Of course, Jesus said that. But he said, because of the riches, he said he could not get past of what he owned to get something that was more valuable than what he could ever imagine. Amen? Praise the Lord. So what happened? Well, Jesus challenged them. So instead of Jesus coming and saying, 
oh yeah, just follow me and this will be okay. We'll, you know, uh, uh, repeat after me this little, this little prayer and you'll be in the kingdom. He didn't do that. He didn't lessen it. Basically, he brought the guide back to what he should have known and what he should have been doing. And from there, let's launch out to what now can be. So when, when we pray, are we prepared to do the next thing that God wants us to do? Or are we just sitting there waiting to get what we, our needs met? Because God wants to move beyond your needs. He wants to move beyond what you ask or think. Isn't that what the Bible says? Okay? And he wants to put his power within us to work through us to get these things accomplished. But what happened is, little did I know that when I said yes to the Lord, uh, matter of fact, it came through several prophecies that I was going to be a pastor. And uh, I didn't necessarily really want to be a pastor, but I said, this was the Lord. I trust the people. This is God. And, of course, God lays it on my heart. Little did I know what that opened up 37 years later, whatever it was. Little did I know what that was going to do. But now when I look back, and look at all the things that we've done and been accomplished and all the different countries that we've been to and all the things that my wife and I have done. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. Because not only did I take what God, asking God for my needs to be met, not only did I take my needs to be met, but God helped me meet other people's needs also. And the miracles that we've seen here and the different things here is minuscule compared to what I saw in West Africa, compared to what I saw in, in Chile, uh, compared to what I saw in Guatemala. Okay, the, the, it's minuscule. But God took my life, he said, and, and I remember when I first was going to get on the plane to go to Chile. It was in 1999, I think it was, and uh, I, was, I had an opportunity to go. I said, I'm going to go. And we just had, we had just built the center. We just built this part here, and it looked, things were bad. Uh, we were in debt up to our eyeball. Everything looked bad. And God said, this is the opportunity. I want you to go. We were having problems and different things in the church, and I was trying to get things solved. To go means I had to leave my wife home alone by herself, and I had to go uh, off uh, for a 10-day trip in Chile and then minister to I don't know who or what. And I got there. We did minister. We had a great time. Uh, we saw lots of miracles. We saw people who were laying hands, people praying for people. People were wonderful in Chile. And um, didn't understand a the thing they were saying, but um, they, they, <laughs> but they were great people. <laughs> but anyway, come back home again, and little did I know, I thought, well, man, I got, I'm, I'm sitting on the plane, and I'm flying, which so I flew from Key West. To, I always fly out of Key West Airport. I don't, I don't, I don't drive up the U.S. one. Anyway, I flew, flew to Miami, to Miami Airport and then get back on. I remember coming back on the plane to Key West uh, from Ovalle, Chile. And I'm sitting there, or Santiago, and from sitting there, and I think, oh, my God, what, what am I going to land to? This is before the days of cell phones and all this other stuff. I said, when am I going to land and, and come into the church? So my wife met me at the airport, and I get, I get home, and she says, everything went great. It did? I said, she said, yeah. She said, it was perfect. She said, you and, and this person. And she started sharing. So she had more stories than I had. I said, this is something else. I says, I got the key to success. I just don't need to be here. <laughs> and it happened in Chile twice. It took two trips to Chile. It happened in Chile, Guatemala, same thing. I come back, and, oh, everything's fine. Wow, man, this will this will get to a guy's ego. <laughs> man, I go, I get back on the plane and go to another mission field. And it was it was five weeks in Africa, the first time, four weeks the first time, five weeks the second time in West Africa. And I come home, and every time I come home, and everything's fine. I said, "Come on, you, you can't be fine." I mean, when I left, this person was on that person. This is that, and she said, "No, she it's all taken care of." And God spoke to me one day. He says, what you have done, he says, you brought me into the mix. He said, you sown yourself. He said, and I've taken care of your home. So the more I went away, it seemed like the more the Holy Spirit showed up. I was starting to be, get on a bent to start going someplace else. I was looking for But the fact is, it, it was it. But come, coming home. And, and this is what God does. When we sow what we have, we sow ourselves into things. He magnifies that, something fierce. It was wonderful. Not only that, I, I have stories of miracles and stuff that God did in, in West Africa, West Africa especially. West Africa, to me, was a cultural shock. <laughs> um, but, I, I mean, we, when we got there, the, what God opened up and the different things he had and the different challenges that we went through. When I come home, I was exhausted. But the fact is, when, when we did those things, we sowed ourselves, God took care of home. Maybe the key to answered prayer, the kind of answers that we're talking about, isn't so much of getting my needs met, 
Maybe it's what, I can, what can I sow myself into so I can get involved in what God is doing, not just worrying about what, what I need. Because the Bible says our needs are supplied according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus, not according to ours, according to his. Think about that. So our, our, our needs are met, or supplied, not met, supplied. So that means when you have a need and use it up, you get another need, you keep supplying that need according to his riches and glory. Well, according to his riches and glory means we have to go back and we have to sow ourselves into him. And that co-laboring with God is what brings it all together. So now when God gives you a little twinge of something and it just comes up and you're looking for that coconut tree and he gives you a coconut, I switch it up. I just, you know, more home, okay? I got a coconut tree. So when he gives you a coconut, how many coconut trees are in that coconut? But how many coconut trees are the result of planting that coconut or egg corn or any other tree kind of tree on it? So the thing that you're in looking for might come in seed form. Amen? I remember I was believing God for a healing one time. And I just, I prayed and prayed. I've stood on the word. I've confessed the word of that. And nothing was happening. I mean, just nothing was happening. And God says, what I have given, I'll pull out of you to give away. And I just got that word. I said, I went in Sunday morning. I said, I said anybody here? And I, I was praying for people. And I've come across a person who had the same affliction as me. And I prayed. And all of a sudden, God healed it right there. He said, if I can get it through you, I'll get it to you. So what happens, the word that I got first time was a seed word, but I had to do something. Tomorrow morning I'm going diving, but I've already done the work and done all the, the certifications to do the dive I want to do tomorrow morning. But it's God who brings the protection. Amen? It was a few, it was, uh, it was a year or so ago, and I guess it was a while ago. And uh, they, uh, there was another dive boat, not the company I go with, and they lost a diver. And it was a woman, a woman in her 50s, and she, she, they just lost her. Uh, the Coast Guard was out, the, uh, everybody was out, the divers looking for her. And nobody found her. I went the next day, we were on that same wreck, went to the same dive, and uh, I was tied up to the, actually the same uh, mooring ball that the other boat had. And Diane and I get in the water, and the water's kind of cloudy, you couldn't see, God, see why they couldn't find her. But um, all of a sudden, I came down, and there was a 40 foot down below the surface. I just opened up. Went down to the deck of the water, and down about 151 feet was to the bottom was this woman's body. And I went down, and I recovered the woman's body. And what I found out later on, I found out later on, legal authorities will not go that deep. There was nobody that would go that deep to get them. And basically, I'd, well, everything's computerized now. I still looked at my computer. I didn't violate any of my NDLs, which is a nice, anyway, it's, it's jar, jargon, technical jargon. I didn't violate anything. 18 minutes later, I brought it back. And I thought about what I did. I thought about that family, because she had a wife, or she had a husband and, and two kids. And I thought about that family from, that they would miss their mom ever see again or know what happened to her, because she just disappeared. Evidently, she had some kind of heart trouble or whatever, and just under the ocean. That's a bad place to have a heart attack. But I brought it back. And somebody said to me, said, well, why did you do that? I said, because it was the right thing to do. I said, because I thought not of the woman's body. I mean, she's in heaven or whatever. I said, but, I says, but the family who has to listen to that. So God says, you just sowed into a family. He says, and for that, he says, your family will be protected. He says, you, you said that, that isn't, isn't over with. Oh, I, I, at first I was criticized. I was anything but a hero <laughs> because I did that and ruined somebody's dive day when you bring a body up from the bottom of the ocean. But the fact is, 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 is this is what was, was done. How did I get to that point to where I was in a position Nobody else saw this woman's body. Diane and I, we both saw it together. I mean, it was like God just pushed back the ocean and opened it up to where she was very visible, very visible. I mean, I'm on my way down. The first dive, I'm on my way down. I wasn't looking for anybody. I figured they'd been looking for her from the day before. I said they were all over, and nobody could find her. The, the sheriff's department, the Coast Guard, I mean, they all. And uh, the next day, I get on the boat because I wanted to see exactly what we saw. The next day, 
didn't have those conditions. They closed it back up again. It was like a window of opportunity. And the Coast Guard, I see the Coast Guard talking to our captain. He's pointing to me on the, on the boat under the dock and pointing to me and said, oh, here it comes. I, I, I've messed with somebody's, uh, but he didn't. They, they came up and, they, and wanted a report, and I had to fill out some papers and different things that happened. But the fact is, is I looked at that. <clears throat> First I saw, I said, Lord, I said, I said, I said you know, it, we bring peace upon the family. I'm down 151 feet. I'm looking at this woman. <laughs> and uh, I air put, um, hit the power inflator on her, on her uh, BCD, and Bear started bringing her to, a, to the surface. <clears throat> and um, I said, Lord, all I could think of was a peace on that family. Those prayers there that are unselfish prayers for somebody else is what's bringing the seed to you and it's what's f fertilizing, cultivating that seed. Are you here? Can you see now why the devil wants us to be so selfish that all we think about is ourselves? And to be so self-centered that all he wants to think about is ourselves. Amen? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I like what Jesus said in John, I'm going to close with this, but I like what Jesus said, he said in John 15, he says, um, I am the vine, the true vine, and my father is the drying dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, I take it away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. So how many here are bearing fruit? Be prepared to get pruned. <laughs> so God takes away every branch that doesn't produce anything, but every branch that he does produ that produces fruit, his reward is pruning you. Is that a good one to leave on? I don't know. Praise the Lord. <laughs> But anyway, I look for God's pruning. Praise the Lord. Is looking for anything else. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. At the close of the live stream, I'll go ahead and we'll pray for anybody that needs to be a prayer for. I'll pray this prayer, and then we'll go ahead and close out the live stream, and I'll, I'll pray for any need at all you want. Uh, come and see me and our leadership, and we'll just be glad to pray for you uh, for whatever the need is. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for the presence of God. We thank you for what you've deposited in us in the name of Jesus. I thank you for the people that showed up this morning, Father God, that wanted to be in your presence, not just by live stream, but wanted to be in your presence, Father God, in, your, in, in the midst of your people. Where two or three are gathered and in your name, uh, your spirit is in the midst of those are gathered. We thank you, Father God, for your presence. We declare your presence to be here. Lord, now, Lord, so now anoint us that we can go ahead and lay hands and bless somebody else Father God give this thing away that you deposit in us so it opens us up for more in the name of Jesus we give you praise we thank you for it and everybody church said amen, amen.